The tongue-eating isopod might just be one of the most objectively nightmarish creatures in the ocean. Also called the tongue-eating louse, these parasitic creatures are crustaceans belonging to the order of isopods, which comprise a range of oceanic species, and even some terrestrial species that you might know such as the woodlouse or pillbug. These parasites are very small, with females growing to only 29 millimeters and males to about 15, but that only makes these creatures even more ruthlessly effective. These creatures are known for exactly what's in their name, they first enter a fish through its gills, before proceeding to attach to their victim's tongue. The isopod then uses its small claws to sever the blood vessels in the fish's tongue, eventually leading to necrosis, or cell death, after which point the fish's tongue falls off, only for the isopod to attach itself to the remaining tongue stump, effectively becoming the fish's new tongue. Once the isopod has replaced the host tongue, there are a couple different parasitic behaviors that may manifest. Namely, the isopod feeding upon the fish's mucus, blood, or both. Despite the obvious harm done, the host fish's new isopod tongue tends to be surprisingly functional, like a bizarre prosthetic. Parasitized fish will still be able to swallow and consume food, just as they were able to with their former given tongue. This makes the tongue-eating isopod unique for being a parasite that replaces a host's organ with a functioning substitution. As if the tongue-eating isopods couldn't get any stranger, they also sexually reproduce within the host fish's mouth, after which their parasitic offspring will exit the original host fish, intent on someday repeating the tongue-replacing process that they're programmed for. These parasites are fairly widespread, being found in the Pacific Ocean off Mexico and Central America, as well as in some parts of the Atlantic such as off the southeastern US. Known host fishes of the tongue-eating isopods include the snappers, as well as the Atlantic menhaden, which some fishermen in the southeastern US have reportedly called bug mouths due to the frequency at which they are parasitized. Tongue-eating isopods often survive the death of their host fish. Many fishermen have caught parasitized fish, only to find their tongue-eating or replacing hitchhikers very much still alive. Many commercially caught fish come with parasites that are almost always removed before being sold to people. However, there have been cases of tongue-eating isopods appearing in product sold to people at grocery stores. Rest assured, there have never been any cases of tongue-eating isopods showing interest in humans. In fact, it's biologically impossible for one of these creatures to parasitize a human in the manner it would a fish. The sea lamprey, sometimes called vampire fish, are referred to by Noah as ancient and primitive, thought to have been relatively unchanged for the past 340 million years. These jawless, eel-like creatures are prolific parasites, feeding upon the blood and bodily fluids of unlucky fish with horrific efficiency thanks to their sucker-like mouth full of countless rows of sharp teeth. As cartilaginous fishes, lampreys do not have skeletons, nor do they possess scales, fins, or gill covers. They breathe through seven tiny gill-like openings located behind their eyes and are known to grow up to four feet long, typically weighing in at just over five pounds. A lamprey's life cycle is complex and variable. Larval lampreys are not actually parasitic, and they're not even born with eyes. They can exist in this stage for several years or even upwards of a decade, depending on the conditions of their environment. After significant metamorphosis, Post-larval sea lampreys enter their parasitic stage, typically lasting between 12 and 18 months, during which time a single lamprey may kill up to 40 pounds of fish, according to NOAA. After this parasitic stage, lampreys stop feeding and migrate up rivers in search of suitable spawning areas. Following spawning, adult lampreys die naturally. As if sea lampreys weren't already devastatingly efficient enough, they're naturally adapted to tolerate a wide range of salinities, meaning they can live in both salt and fresh water. While they're native to the northern and western Atlantic Ocean, as well as the Connecticut River in the northeast US, sea lampreys are highly infamous invaders of the Great Lakes, as well as Lake Champlain of Vermont and New York. As highly aggressive and capable predators, 
Lampreys devastated native fish populations in the Great Lakes, particularly lake trout, which were considered top of their native food chain before the appearance of invasive lampreys. Lampreys have been a headache for the people, and fish, of the Great Lakes for nearly 200 years since they most likely entered via man-made shipping canals in the 1830s. Additionally, you'll find sea lampreys off the coasts of much of Europe, including in the Mediterranean and Black Seas. Lampreys are particularly abundant in southwestern Europe, where they are commonly eaten. Further east, lampreys are also a prized delicacy in Latvia. Human consumption of lampreys is absolutely nothing new, as these fish were a favorite food of the British elite during the medieval period. Indeed, in the year 1135, ailing King of England Henry I reportedly asked for a surfeit of lampreys to dine on against the advice of his physician. He would die not long after. Copepods are tiny crustaceans found in just about every aquatic environment, both fresh and salt water, and some of them are highly parasitic. Approximately 14,000 species of copepods have been described, and of those, about half are thought to be parasites. Parasitic copepods may affect pretty much any kind of sea creature imaginable, from bony fish and sharks to other crustaceans, mollusks, tunicates, and corals. Copepods come in a wide variety of shapes and appearances, sometimes being highly modified in order to better parasitize their chosen host. Note that in this footage, the parasitic copepod is the longer yellow object on the rat tail fish, whilst the white objects are parasitic marine leeches. Ironically, parasitic copepods themselves may be host to even tinier parasites, such as single-celled dinoflagellates. Saculina are a genus of barnacles that parasitize crabs in unique and disturbing ways. Larval female saculina barnacles will inject their soft bodies directly into their crab victim, growing within the host until a parasitic sac protrudes from the crab's underside, where it would normally incubate eggs. In doing so, saculina destroys the crab's reproductive parts, sterilizing their victim for life. The barnacle effectively tricks and manipulates the host crab into treating the parasitic sac as if it were its own eggs, causing the crab to defend its own attacker. There are two bodily components of saculina. The aforementioned sac protruding from the host crab, called the externa, and the portion of the barnacle's body that's completely inside the host, the interna, which is essentially a network of root-like tendrils that grow around the host's organs and ultimately steal its nutrients. An adjacent genus of parasitic barnacles, Briarosacus, have a similar internal structure of taking over the host's body to an even more frightening degree. Their tendrils have been found to reach all the way up to the host crab's brain and central nervous system, effectively allowing the parasite to puppeteer its host crab and greater control its behavior. This has led some to refer to the victims of Briarosacus barnacles as zombie crabs. Crabs parasitized by saculina become physically stunted and impaired compared to healthy crabs, they lose the abilities to molt and regrow severed limbs. Male crabs parasitized with saculina will particularly see a dramatic change in their natural behavior, as in addition to castrating its host, the barnacle modifies the male host's body and even its behaviors to match those of a female crab in order to better suit the parasite, such as the male host crab becoming protective of what it thinks are its eggs, but in actuality is the parasitic growth. 
Parasitized males will exhibit such tendencies as releasing hormones and even performing female mating dances. Saculina barnacles have actually been suggested as control agents for the highly invasive European green crab. However, this approach would likely be highly counterproductive as the parasitic barnacles would affect native fauna in addition to the targeted invasive species. Parasitic creatures, especially those in the deep ocean, remain very little understood, even as far as these remote environments go. Unidentified parasites are found on occasion during deepwater ROV expeditions, and there are surely untold amounts more yet to be discovered. Only further expeditions and research can begin to shed light on these mysterious creatures.